We're going to be in Revelation chapter 5. We'll be covering the second half of, of Revelation uh, chapter 5 this morning. Now, one thing I forgot to, to do is uh, I was on the phone with Kenneth, Kenneth Duge, our homegrown missionaries that are now in Cusco. And uh, so I call them about once a month and I, I, uh, just to stay in contact. And, and uh, so as I called him, he was... He lives in Cusco, a 20-hour drive from Lima. He had flown down to Lima to go pick up a new car. <laughs> and if you know, and, and many of you donated to their new car, but if you knew, I mean, their, their uh, Volkswagen uh, bus that they were driving all over Cusco, uh, like literally... It was like the Flintstones. I don't know if you know about the Flintstones. They put their feet through the floor and go like this. <laughs> As you're driving, you're looking at the ground going underneath you. And, and it was, it, it, literally, that car was a miracle. <laughs> that it kept on running and running and running and running. Uh, but, you know, you had to hold the door shut so it wouldn't fly open and people fly out. All just kinds of real fun stuff. And uh, we've been praying for, and uh, many of you have donated towards um, them purchasing a new car. So he found a, uh, a Jeep uh, Grand Cherokee in Lima for $10,000 with 50,000 miles on it. Just an absolute miracle. Now listen, because of the taxes in, in Peru, many times cars are at least double the amount that they are here. Like literally. So it was an absolute miracle car. And so he was just picking it up when I called him. And so he took some pictures of it. And I'll, I'll try to remember to show you guys next week. But that's such an answer to prayer. And thank you guys. And, and uh, thank you guys for giving towards uh, them having a car. So next time we visit them, we're not going to die in that, <laughs> that coffin of a Volkswagen van. <laughs> anyway, so let's go ahead and pray and we'll get into the study. Dear Lord, we, uh, we thank you for this day. Lord, we do thank you for the north wind, the dry air. Lord, which is so, so refreshing for us, Lord, but uh, uh, you give us what we need when we need it. We needed that. Thank you, Lord. And we just ask that you'd quicken our hearts, uh, open up our hearts to speak to us individually that we may enjoy you more and you may enjoy us more, Lord. Draw us close, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so the title of today's study is Worship in the Throne Room. Now, it sounds familiar because in chapter 4, we had uh, a, uh, a title of the same, but this is part 2, okay? And we're going to be looking at worship this morning. And so, a few quotes about worship as you turn your, your Bibles to uh, chapter 5 of Revelation. A.W. Tozer, I can safely say on the authority of all that is revealed in the word of God that any man or woman on this earth who is bored and turned off by worship is not ready for heaven. I mean, a heck of a lot of worship there in heaven. Uh, G.K. Chesterton said, we are, we, are not perish or we are perishing for lack of wonder, not for lack of wonders. God has provided all the wonders. We need to be in awe of what God has provided. Francis Chan, isn't it a comfort to worship a God that we cannot exaggerate? And T. Wright, the closer you get to the truth, the clearer becomes the beauty. And the more you will find worship welling up within you. C.S. Lewis, the most valuable things the Psalms do for me is to express the same delight in God which made David dance, and I'll finish, in his underwear, <laughs> before all the people. He was so thrilled on God. Jack Hayford, worship changes the worshiper into the image of the one worshiped. And I like that, because if you're a surfer, you tend to try to surf like your favorite surfer. If you're a golfer, you want to buy the same clubs as your favorite golfer. Those types of things. We, we do this. But if you worship Jesus, you're going to slowly be conformed into the image of Jesus. And Lamar Boschman said, when I worship, I would rather my heart be without words than my words without heart. Very true. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. So why is this worship thing in heaven going to happen again? Now remember, in the book of Revelation, John gets this vision. Then the Lord tells him, write those things that that, that, that you've seen, chapter 1, write those things that exist now, that the time of the church, seven churches representing all of the church age, and then finally, write those things that come after this. And in chapter 4, 
the voice says, come up here, John. And then he's given a vision of the throne room. So after the things of the earth, after the time of the church age, he is translated into heaven and gets a vision of the throne room of God. And so immediately there's worship happening in the throne room of God. And now this is the second worship session that we see in the throne room of God. Now, why is this worship about to happen? Well, one of the keys to Revelation just occurred. We looked at it last week. To make all of those in attendance start worshiping. What had happened? Well, oops, all my quotes. I don't know how it ended up like that. Sorry about that, but I'm not so good with PowerPoint. <laughs> Well, what had happened was there was this document that was handed out by God the Father on the throne. And, and, and what happened is as he hands it out, everybody's looking around like, this is a radical document and no one's grabbing it. No one's going forth to get it. And John even starts to cry. And he's thinking no one can grab the throne because they're not qualified. And then what happens? Jesus comes forward and he's able to take this document. And so worship is going to happen. Now, as, as God the Father holds out this document, remember before the throne, there's 12 representatives from the New Testament church. There's 12 representatives from, from the Old Testament saints. These are righteous guys cleansed in the blood of Jesus, but they're not able to take the throne. God the Father is there. He has a throne, but he's not able to open it. God the Holy Spirit is there. He has, the, or, uh, God the Holy Spirit is there. But he is not able to unroll this scroll. Who else is there? Well, you have angels or cherubim around the throne of God. They're not able to open the throne. But only Jesus was able to open the throne. Now, what was in this? We looked at this last week. In this scroll that could be progressively unrolled and opened is some type of official document. Some people say the deed to the ear. Some people say an inheritance for mankind to receive. And we learned last week that God had this contract with man that man was going to be in control of the earth and it was going to be ruled in a way that God wanted him to rule the earth. But, but man was going to be in control of it. And Adam and Eve had this right. But what did Adam and Eve do? They blew it. They, they weren't able to, to fulfill God's plan for the earth. And so what's happening here is, is God is handing out this scroll to someone who is going to be able to fulfill God's plan for the earth. Okay, and, and so that is what is happening here. Now at the end as this scroll is opened and you get to the seventh seal and the seventh seal are the bowl and the trumpet judgments. And at the very end of the bowl and the trumpet judgments that are contained in the seventh seal in this document, Jesus Christ is coronated as king to sit on David's throne, ruling and reigning on David's throne in Jerusalem for literally a thousand years. And then at the very, very end of this scroll, that thousand years is up. And what do we see? We see a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem come out of heaven. And guess who's going to be sitting on the throne again? Jesus Christ will be sitting on the throne. This is why this book is called the revelation or the unveiling or the coronation of Jesus Christ. That is, is the reason. And this scroll is an intricate part of it and Jesus is able to take this and therefore a party breaks out again before the throne of God a worship party as it were so verse 8 goes on where we're starting today it says now when he had taken the scroll the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb Jesus each having a harp and golden bowls of incense which are the prayers of the saints and so when Jesus takes the scroll, the cherubim and the church and Old Testament, they fall down and worship before the throne. And they're, they're playing harps. You guys probably should learn the guitar now because <laughs> stringed instruments. But and, and it says that they're, they're, they're singing a new song before the Lord with these harps. In Psalm 144 verse 9 it says, I will sing a new song to thee, O God, upon a harp of ten strings. I will sing praises unto thee. And so... 
We see there they have a harp, but they also have golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So what are these golden bowls of incense? Obviously, John says right here that they are the prayers of the saints, chapter 5, verse 8. But it's interesting, when you go back to Psalms, it says, May my prayer be counted as incense before thee, the lifting up my, of my hands as an evening offering. May my prayer be counted as incense before the Lord. Now, it's interesting, and physiologically this does bear out as well, that when you smell something, out of all the senses, touch and hearing and sight, but out of all the senses, it's been proven scientifically that when you smell something and it reminds you of something, that memory is more vivid. And it's a real strong memory, right? And, and, and very often you can think, oh yeah, that one thing, or it might be mom's apple pie, or whatever it might be, but it's like, whoa, it's there. And so God knows this, and, and so he, he describes our prayers bringing to him a strong sense of pleasure. And that's the idea behind Incense, may my prayer be counted as incense, something lovely, something wonderful unto the Lord. In Revelation 8, 3, it says, Then another angel, having a golden censer, something that holds incense, came and stood at the altar, and he was given much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar that was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. And that's after the opening of the seventh, the seventh seal. Also, the priests in the tabernacle would burn incense before the Lord and pray for the people. Now, when Mary in the New Testament was found with child, she was led by the Lord to go visit her relative Elizabeth, who was older than her, much older than her. And she had this miracle child within her belly when, when Mary visited her. Now, Elizabeth's husband was a priest. And it says in Luke chapter 1, verse 8 through 10, it came about while he was performing his priestly service before God in the appointed order of his division, according to the custom of the priestly office, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and to burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were in prayer outside at the hour of incense offering. This was a tradition. They always understood that incense represented their prayers before God. Now it's also interesting that the prayers are saved in heaven and we're given the image of our prayers being saved in these bowls. And if you've been a Christian for any amount of time and been a part of prayer meetings, and I encourage you to be a part of prayer meetings. In fact, men, on Tuesday nights we have prayer at 6 till 7 every Tuesday night so that then you can make it to the men's study. So come an hour early and pray with us. That would be awesome. But... We, we, um, we know that if you've been in a prayer meeting, you've prayed prayers. And you've literally forgot about the prayers that you prayed. And then it might be a few years, a few decades later. Then all of a sudden you hear about something, you're like, oh yeah, I prayed about it. The thing is, you forgot about it, but God never forgot about your prayers. Isn't that awesome? God cares about your prayers. And when you pray as a child of God, some people say, I'm not going to pray publicly because I don't sound very good. I don't know how to pray. Well, one, you get better at praying by praying a lot. But God doesn't care the style of your prayer. He just wants to hear your heart. Because it is a sweet smelling aroma unto him. And he never, ever forgets your prayer. And so, as we look at this, this idea of prayers representing incense and incense being good or soothing to God, it's just a very interesting idea. Like, God's up there in heaven with his big God-sized nose going, good. That's not what God does, but it's interesting because a lot of people go, well, that's dumb. You know, you think your God hasn't... No, 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 no. Understand, God is so high and above us, and we're so small, sinful, and limited that he has to try to describe things for us that we can even begin to grasp the fullness of the concept of who he is. 
It's not the Bible being dumb. It's God dumbing himself down so we dum-dums can understand the awesomeness of God, right? And so when it describes him as, as having a nose, the actual official term is, I'm sure you're going to use this in Bible trivia or something, but it's an anthropomorphism, giving God human characteristics to help us understand things beyond our understanding, right? And so that's what's happening here. But ultimately, the idea is that your sincere prayers bring great pleasure to God. And so we see this image there in heaven and we get to verse 9 and it says, and they sang a new song. Revelation 5, 9. They sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and you have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe, tongue, people, and nation, and you have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. And so it says here, they sang a new song. God enjoys a new song coming from your heart. A new song coming from your heart. And the idea of new songs is very common in the Psalms. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy. Psalm 40, he put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Psalm 96, 1, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Psalm 98, oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done wonderful things. Psalm 144, I will sing a new song to thee, O God. Psalm 149, verse 1, praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. When I was younger, my, my parents' church went through a little bit of a split and a bunch of people started going to this, this, this church called New Song. And I thought, well, that's a dumb name. <laughs> I don't think it's a dumb name anymore. And there's an incredible idea be, behind our heart presenting to God a new song. Understand that a new song is not an old song. It's a new song. Now, some of you young people are going, don't play those old songs anymore. <laughs> That's not what it really ultimately means. The fact is, it may be old lyrics, but for a new song to be sung, it needs to be currently accurate to where your heart is. So, old song, if you've been walking with the Lord for any amount of time, Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. Or Jesus loves me, an old song. But really, God sees your heart. So you can sing, Lord, I lift your name on high. You know, you can be out there doing that. Or you can be going on your knees, hands up, just, Lord, I lift your name on high. That's a new song because it's, it's where you are at the moment in your relationship with God. Right? So you can sing an old hymn as a new song from your heart as long as it truly is coming from your heart. Men, you ever tell your wife, I love you? She looks at you like, <laughs> you know, you, <laughs> you have, she, she knows, right? With her superpowers. She knows <laughs> whether you really mean it or not at the moment. And the Lord wants a new song from your heart because you're living a day to day relationship. With him, where's your heart at as you are singing? Are you experiencing God on a daily basis? Listen, in my relationship with my wife, I am in trouble if I only speak about and reflect upon how I once loved her. How would that go over? Man, I used to really love you, babe. I used to really think you're beautiful, babe. No, I'd be dead, right? <laughs> Wouldn't be happening. So the fact of the matter is we are in a living relationship with God which is current, creating new time experiences with him unless of course you're not. Now when I say this, it's like, ooh, pastor took a punch at us. No, pastor took a punch at himself first because I realize that I don't always live a new song type life before the Lord. I, I can kind of take it for granted and float for a few days. I'm getting better at it the older I get. And I want my song to be new every morning and every day. 
because of this living relationship that I have with God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again into a what? A living hope. Not a past dead hope where Jesus remained in the grave, but a living hope where he is alive today to ever intercede for you. Blessed be... Um, oops, I already read that. <laughs> Prior to going into the promised land, Moses said to the people, what? Now, remember, Deuteronomy is a, is a motivational speech. It's believed that there's three speeches that Moses gave to the people. Moses was told, you can't go into the promised land. You're going to die. But here's Joshua and here's the people. You've been prepared for this for 40 years. And so Deuteronomy is a, is a pep talk. You've got to do this. You've got to do this. Make sure you do this. And, and he reiterates the law as well as he gives them this, this pep talk. And in Deuteronomy 31, verse 8, he says, And the Lord, he is currently the one who goes in the future before you. He will be in the future with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear nor be dismayed. He is always with you, living life with you. And therefore, you need to seek to experience a daily relationship with God and not lack for a new song. And here's a hint, guys. When you're not living a new song, it's not God's fault. <laughs> because God is always there. And we put our backs against God. And we decide not to pray that day. Not to worship him that day. Not to read about him that day. Not to be in fellowship with him. And so this new song is very important. So what song are they singing? They're singing, the lamb alone is worthy to redeem the world because he was slain. He's worthy to take the scroll as well. Now, with this, with this contract, he, he had to be able to pay the price. Well, he paid the price by what? Being slain. You, you, you don't get a contract. The other day, I, I bought a new in, in insurance policy for my home. And, and I had to go by and I had to pay for it. And then I get the insurance policy. Jesus paid to be able to take that scroll. Worthy are you, Jesus. Worthy to take the scroll. Now, there is a theme in the scripture that is placed there for this specific event. And it's amazing. You see it, little hints of it throughout all of scripture. So just one more thing for us to understand that God gave us this progressive revelation and it's not some random accident and it's not like at the last second, oh, I'm going to kill Jesus. It's not about that. It was God's plan all the way back. And throughout the law and throughout the Jewish culture, there's a theme placed there for this specific event for us to get it. Now understand, God not only promised the people Israel future things, he also gave promises about the specific land that they were to inherit. And I want you to note, and we did a prophecy update that talked about this a little bit um, a, a few weeks ago, but the land of Israel is beautiful. But I'm from California. I used to go backpacking every summer in, in uh, the upper parts of Yosemite. <coughs> Yosemite Valley, one of the most beautiful places on earth. Yellowstone, incredible, way more beautiful than just the physical land of Israel. Israel has hardly any resources either. It's not really mineral rich. Recently they found oil and, and gas, natural gas off the coast, and that's very interesting in and of itself, but, but it's not really like the place to die for. And it's this teeny little strip of land along the Mediterranean. And, and they go through droughts. But the whole world is focused on Israel. And it's crazy that the whole world is focused on Israel. Why? Well, because Satan wants to destroy God's plan for his land. He very much cares about his land. And, and as, as he um, caused the people to come into the promised land... His people, he brought them into the promised land. They pushed out the people from in front of them, the rebellious Canaanites. And he divvied up the land to tribes and to families within there. And God said, I want you to have this land. And it's important that you have this land. And so the land was very important to him. 
And so what ended up happening is he wanted to keep the land in the family, so he set up many ways to do so. So what would happen is if you were poor, you'd sell a portion of your land to someone else outside of the family. You'd get some money. But God didn't want you to not have that land. And so God had set up a system that every time there was, there was a set of seven years, remember seven, that they had to live by and every seventh year they were supposed to let the land lay fallow, which is a very good agricultural practice. And, and, and after the seventh seven, after 49 years, there was this 50th year. And maybe you've heard the term, the year of Jubilee. On the year of Jubilee, everybody's property, no matter who bought it, no matter how much you paid for it, goes back to the family. Everything is redeemed back to the family that it was originally given to by God, period. That's what the year of Jubilee is. Everything is restored and redeemed and made new, given back to the family. Now, uh, another thing... Um, that would happen in the interim because the family really was supposed to not sell it off but keep it no matter what. And so if someone had sold off a piece of property and it was going to be sold again, the first people that it was offered to were members of that family that originally owned it. So first right of offer went only to the family or to what is called the kin. Those that are related because God cared about the land. It says in Leviticus 25, 25, if one of your brother becomes poor and has sold some of his possession, and if his, if his redeeming relative comes to redeem it, then he may redeem it, deem, redeem what his brother had sold. And so this is called the law of the kinsman redeemer. A family member who is able to purchase because they have enough money to purchase it, the land that you originally had lost. They're able to get back what you had lost. And, and, and again, you're going to see it clearer in a moment. So a close relative who had the finances to purchase the property back for the family. And if not, the property would be returned after the 50th year jub jubilee. Now sometimes, as in the book of Ruth, a person came attached with the property. And so Boaz was able to purchase as a close relative or a kinsman, purchaser or redeemer property as well as a wife. Now, Jesus was worthy. He was able to pay for that which was lost. But he came as a man, therefore he came as a relative to the man who had lost it in the first place. What was Jesus? Kinsman, redeemer. That's what he was. And I just find it amazing because God's plan, when we get to heaven and we start looking at God's word from fresh eyes, we're going to see so much more of this. But I just, I love it that God plants this whole idea of kinsman, redeemer, kinsman, redeemer, kinsman, redeemer, land, people, rescuing them from slavery, rescuing that which was lost and returning it to its rightful place. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing here. First Peter 1.18, knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, Adam, <laughs> but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. He was able to pay the price. And so he has the right and is worthy to redeem all things. I love this statement. He took the highest seat because he humbled himself to the lowest place in order to love to the highest those who were truly the lowest. And that would be us. And again, Philippians chapter 2, 9, we recognize that. God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, those in heaven and those on the earth and those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He is truly the great redeemer. Now, so he, re he was worthy to redeem. He is the kinsman redeemer. Who did he redeem? Well, that song reveals it. He purchased people from every race, tribe, tongue, culture. However God divides that up, we don't know. But in heaven, yellow, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Racism should not be a part of any Christian's theology. 
because we are all made in the image of God to bring God glory. In fact, the different races should just be uh, just a wonderful applause to God for his intense and, and amazing creativity. And, and, and it's amazing, right? You, you take someone from the uh, deepest, darkest part of Africa and they can get married to someone from northern Europe that has not a pigment of, uh, of melanin in their skin at all, you know, and they can create a beautiful mixed baby, right? And it's beautiful to God. God does not care about race one bit. And so there, he's glorified for that. And what else do they glorify God for? And we shall reign upon the earth. And they're like, oh, I got power. No, I don't think they're power hungry. I think they're more flabbergasted that God would ever trust them with any authority. Right? Every so often I look around the church, I'm like going, you know, as a young man, you start thinking, church needs to be bigger. I need to have more authority. As an old man, knowing yourself a little bit better, you start to go, what in the world are you thinking, God? I'm people's pastor. That's nuts. <laughs> These poor people, I need to pray better for them, you know? But, but you know, the idea is like, we're going to rate, like, that's crazy. Those were purchased by the blood of the Lamb will reign with Christ in his millennial kingdom here on earth. We're going to have authority. That's scary. <laughs> That God would do such a thing with such sinful creatures. But it will be a blessing. And we're not going to rule with the authority that we see around us. And, and, and putting people down and shoving them into their place. And punishing people. We're going to rule and reign in righteousness. And we're going to be, instead of pushing back against evil. We're going to be doing the opposite. We're going to be promoting righteousness in this position. And so we will not only be authorities, but will also be priests. And again, it's such an amazing thing that such a broken people can be so redeemed, reformed, elevated, and purified that we would be called priests unto God. Again, what does a priest do? A priest represents God to men and men to God. God to men and men to God. First Peter 2.9, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. The other night, um, we had uh, 40 kids over at our house having a game night and a time of worship around the fire pit and stuff. And it was great. We, we really enjoy that. And, um, and inevitably, you know, the, the blessing is people will bring uh, unbelievers to a Christian party. No drugs, no alcohol, no hooking up. At least I hope no hooking up. <laughs> no drugs, no alcohol, no hooking up. But everybody had a great time. And so my question to those that, that brought friends that may not know the Lord is, did they enjoy it? And, and when the answer is yes, I go, oh Lord, we represented you well. And so we are in a sense priests because we represent God to man. Right? What is, what is God like? It should come out in who you are. And over time, more and more and more. And the other side is, when you pray for your friends that aren't believers, what are you doing? You're representing that person to God. You're called to be a priest. And so they're just, again, I think they're just praising God because they're blown away. Like, I get to represent you. Like, no way. This is so awesome. And then the song grows and continues just louder. So you have these 24 elders, you have these, these uh, angels right? Verse 11 goes on in chapter 5 of Revelation. It says, Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power, riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing. So what happens is you have, all of a sudden, when someone's singing, it sounds beautiful, right? That would have already been beautiful. And then all of a sudden, the choir joins in. And this choir, by my calculations, is at least 204 million voices. At least. Possibly more than 200 million uh, and four 
200 million, 204 million voices, right? More, probably billions as far as that. When the Bible does that, it's saying a number you can't even count. It's not giving you an exact number. And they're singing in unison. This is called the song of redemption. Actually, verses uh, 9 through 12. It honors the price of redemption. You were slain. The worker of redemption. You have redeemed us. The song honors the destination of redemption. You have redeemed us where? To God. The payment by your blood. The scope. Every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. The length. You have made us kings and priests unto our God in eternity. And the result. We shall reign on the earth. And that is their, their new song. And they're just like bursting forth from their heart. These millions upon millions of voices. Verse 13 goes on. It says, And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and as such are as in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing, honor, glory, and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. Now understand, you have the 24 elders, most likely representatives of the church, representatives of the Old Testament saints. You have angels flying around the throne. And then you have millions and hundreds of millions of voices. And they're worshipping Jesus. Now, if Jesus wasn't God, this would be absolute heresy. The commentator Morris says, There cannot be the slightest doubt that the Lamb is to be reckoned with God and as God. And Clark surmises it this way. He says, Now, if Jesus Christ were not properly God, this would be idolatry. As it would be giving to the creature what belongs to the Creator. And understand this. You will, you will absolutely see heaven as hell if you're not fully willing to worship Jesus Christ in all his glory. A lot of people say, well, I want to go to heaven. And I go, well, are you a Christian? Do you worship God? And they go, no, I just want to go to heaven. They go, well, you'll, you'll hate heaven. Because if you don't want to worship now, who says you're going to want to worship then? So in all reality, if you get to heaven and you're not a worshiper of God, you're going to hate heaven. And so there's really no way out because if you don't worship him who is the giver of all things good, when you go to hell, you're going to receive nothing that is good. The smells, the sights, the senses, you know, the taste, the beauty of song. Light will be gone. Your ears are just going to hear sorrow and pain and suffering. Because all that is good is from God. And if you don't, if you, when you choose God, you get all the rest thrown in. When you reject God, you lose everything that he gives. And so, this particular word for worship is to lay yourself down on the ground before God. A lot of people say they believe God, but they don't really, or believe in Jesus, but they don't really believe in Jesus. Why? Well, to worship means to lay on your face in this particular instance. There's several different words for worship. But to lay on your face. Now, if you lay on your back, you can still kind of defend yourself, right? Do you have any defense if you lay on your stomach? I mean, some of you wrestlers are going, sure. No, knock it off. <laughs> but you're really defenseless. You're just saying, I am surrendered to you. I'm all in. I'm not worshiping you and Buddha. I'm completely surrendered to, to your salvation and your future for me. And that's what a true believer is. Not just someone that intellectually acknowledges the existence of a man named Jesus. And so this is true worship. Just surrendering your all to him. And they worship forever and ever. Because God reigns eternally. Leaders come and go. But the Lord will live forever and ever and is forever worthy of our praise. Pagans make their gods. Their gods do not create them. They carry their gods. Their gods do not carry them. They protect their gods. Their gods do not protect them. They sacrifice to their gods. Their gods don't sacrifice for them. 
Their gods are subject to the very creation that they claim they rule. Their God is not the creator and sustainer of all things as our God is. Our God is awesome. And we are his workmanship. Created in him for good works that he laid out beforehand that we may walk in them. Ephesians 2.10 We are capable only because he has made us so. Our ultimate redemption is found in him alone. We experience the reception and dispersion of all things that are good because he has enabled us to do so. We are secure because of him. We experience blessings because of him. We will live in eternity because of him. And he is our all and all. Now we're going to use this as our closing prayer. So the worship team can start to come up here. But you can start to sing along. It'll probably happen if you know this song. But if not, you can just say the words. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God. Worthy is your name, Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Taking my sin, my cross, my shame, rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Jesus. Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. And as we continue in worship, the ushers will come by to receive if you want to worship the Lord through your tithes and offerings at this time. Also, it's a time for prayer. And we just uh, ask if you guys have prayer needs for anything, we'd love to pray with you and for you. If you're here and you don't know Jesus, you don't know that new song, we'd love to pray with you so that you could experience what it means to start eternal life today. Because it will never stop. You might die physically, but you will never experience separation from God spiritually. You can have that eternal spiritual life today. And so we'd love to pray with you and for you. So we'd encourage you uh, to come up as the worship, uh, worship team sings. Let's go ahead and worship the Lord together. God bless you guys.